on behalf of the campus, um, I do welcome you to the 36th edition of the Archives Public Lecture Series. And um, I'm going to go jayatype directly into introducing um, John. And we've been, John and I have been talking about his, uh, his public lecture for, John, how long has it been? Two years? Yeah, thereabouts, yes. <laughs> um, did, did, yeah. And we've, we've bandied around with a couple of different topics and suggestions, but um, I'll, I'll let him speak about this. So uh, just a quick word by way of introduction about John. Um, John is an associate professor at Priya University at Sri City, where he leads uh, classes in the biological sciences, environmental studies, and history. He trained in zoology as an undergraduate and postgraduate, and has received uh, doctorate degrees both in the ecological sciences and the history of science, as well as a master's in medical anthropology. Prior to his um, current work, he's taught at Harvard University, the University of Massachusetts, Duke University, and ISER in Pune. His work focuses on the making of zoology in Euro-colonial India, and more recently, the history of the great influenza for the Spanish flu in the South Asian subcontinent. Um, John, thanks so much for being here. And we do look forward to your talk and uh, hearing more from you and from the audience. So over to you. Thanks, John. Uh, thank you so much, Venka. That's very kind of you. And thank you for having me. I'm just showing something a little bit. There we go. Yeah, cool. Um, let me get started. Thank all of you that are here. Can you hear me fine? Yeah. Okay, good. Okay, good. Right. Let me share my slides and... Can you see this? It's white. Um, can you see this? It's a white screen at this point. How is that happening? We just checked it. Let me stop. Hmm. That's just all. Try, just try it again. Yeah. Let me just close everything else out that I need. And have I got anything else up here? Nope. How's this? Much better. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, let me just see if I can put this on to... All right, so what I'm going to do is... I'm, okay, let me start and maybe I'll take my... All right, I'm gonna go off a uh, screen over here. Um, can you hear me fine? Yep. Okay, fine. Great, so thank you all very much. I'm gonna turn off my phone so that no calls come through. Just one second. Great, thank you. And thank you for being here uh, for archiving grief. There is that last time here on earth for every one of us. And this reflection is an attempt in the wake of recent crippling bereavement to make sense of it. Well, in so doing, my hope is that there may be retrieval for those of us that have encountered intimate loss, that in the knowledge of our shared incapacitation, when faced with the enormity of grief, we are not alone. Perhaps that sense of last is felt the most when it falls upon a next, kin, love, friend. You die by proxy then, for that person that was closer than breathing breathes no more, and somewhere an atmosphere that you shared is extinguished with you in it. When flesh and blood are suborned to a photograph, you are reminded that what you had then has now slipped into the realm of the irretrievable. To everyone then there is that last time. And you inhabit it in the shocks of departure, one succeeding another, even as you unwittingly perhaps prepare for your own. <laughs> 
And it doesn't matter how old you are when you encounter grief. Irrespective of age, grief makes you old. In my endeavor today, the mind will play a central role. That same mind that can play tricks, often distorting the immediate with the most deepening of shadows, but over here, harnessed to the relentless effort of seeking to think through the agony. I propose to adopt this latter approach, employing three lenses. Even as I acknowledge the lure of the alliterative in choosing the cell, the chorus, and the cemetery. The cell. In the year 2002, John Salston, Sidney Brenner, and Robert Horvitz were awarded the Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine for their discoveries concerning the genetic regulation of organ development and programmed cell death. The last words, programmed cell death, are more often reduced to a mechanism that goes by one Greek term, apoptosis or apoptosis or apoptosis, depending on who's doing the pronouncing. Uh, this is immediately to be distinguished from necrosis, where there is the premature death of cells, the site of a wound or an injury. Now, the quietness of apoptosis is what I have likened to the fall of a tree in a forest. And indeed, there was the longest time for no one to see until the three Nobelists mentioned enter the frame. Yet, does programmed cell death signify suicide in miniature? To answer in the affirmative, the danger of imputed agency immediately enters the equation, while a more holistic approach sees this as inevitable, resulting, for instance, in the architecture of our fingers and toes, as we know, because of selective death, rather than be landed with interdigitating webs, such as we find in frogs, for example. Um, and this is what you see, the interdigital tissue, apoptosis, and then you actually get the digits that you find in the case of the mouse. Now, the relentless mini deaths that in many ways are indicative of what we perceive as normal is quite in contrast with another order of scale, greeted time and again by the inevitable punctuating of the geological time scale by what are known as mass extinctions. And you can see over here just what percentage of life is supposed to have gone out with each of these. Now, these are dramatic events grandiloquent statements of death with whole floral and faunal groups consigned to the past in the blink of an evolutionary eye, a paucity of millions of years instead of tens and hundreds, with empty niches ripe for the picking by enterprising pioneers left in the fray. Now I use apoptosis as a point of departure. The quiet deaths in another context, thinking of how you change replace cell by cell, even through life. Like the wood that is likewise removed for another in the proverbial ship of Theseus. That even in the quiet depths, you are you, you to yourself and you to another. Over time, in that wholehearted sense, by that other who loved you then and who loves you still. The moment of wrenching comes in moments that are completely other than quiet at the time when it starts to show. Those moments that affect the individual body in a wholly different way, a statement of portent where cells go rogue. I speak of cancer, where the silences give way to the horror of untrammeled metastases in the most extreme cases. The pathology of cancer, however, is not my intent here. That is left to the unparalleled pen of Siddhartha Mukherjee and the emperor of all maladies. But what it does impel me to do is to turn to literature, excursions to which will pepper much of this talk. I begin with lines composed by the North American author, Susan Sontag, found in her extraordinary book, Illness as Metaphor. As she deals both with tuberculosis, TB also known as consumption and thesis, the romantic disease and cancer. As she writes, illness is the night side of life, a more onerous citizenship. Everyone who is born holds dual citizenship in the kingdom of the well and in the kingdom of the sick. 
Although we all prefer to use only the good passport, sooner or later, each of us is obliged, at least for a spell, to identify ourselves as citizens of that other place. She goes on to say, the fantasies inspired by TB in the last century, by cancer now, and this is in 1978, are responses to a disease thought to be intractable and capricious. That is, a disease not understood in an era in which medicine's central premise is that all diseases can be cured. Any disease that is treated as a mystery and acutely enough feared will be felt to be morally, if not literally, contagious. Now, I shall return to TB in a different context, but what is stripped from cancer is the romance from the outset, leaving only the dread waiting. Sontag herself had cancer and would eventually die of it, an acute myelogenous leukemia. Well, I found myself quite by happenstance chancing upon her grave in the Cimetière de Montparnasse on the Rive Gauche, the left bank in Paris 12 odd years ago. Uh, this, by the way, will be the first of many graves that will also dot this presentation. However, my books of choice, far more recent, that compel my attention are writ written by a doctor and a professor. The first who had lung cancer, the second pancreatic, and neither of whom su survived. Yet before they departed, they left us these. Both books find you with tears springing to your eyes. Randy Porsche has a laundry list he'd want you to hear while he still has the time to tell you. Time must be explicitly managed, like money. You can always change your plan, but only if you have one. Ask yourself, are you spending your time on the right things? Develop a good filing system. Rethink the telephone. Delegate. Take time out. Paul Cullenithy approaches it from another perspective, a moment of recognition when he writes, I began to realize that coming face to face with my own mortality, in a sense, had changed everything and nothing. Seven words from Samuel Beckett began to repeat in my head, I can't go on, I'll go on. Yet both share the deepest pain in the acceptance that they will not see their children grow into full fledged Porsche has his children at six, three, and 1.5, Kalanithi at just eight months. The latter produces the most extraordinary conclusion to his books. Words have a longevity I do not. I thought I could leave her a series of letters, but what would they say? There is perhaps only one thing to say to this infant who is all future, overlapping briefly with me, barring the improbable, is all but past. That message is simple. When you come to one of the many moments in life where you must give an account of yourself, provide a ledger of what you have been and done and meant to the world, do not, I pray, discount that you filled a dying man's days with a sated joy, a joy unknown to me in all my prior years, a joy that does a hunger for more and more, but rests satisfied. In this time, right now, that is an enormous thing. Thus it is that through the ravaging of cells gone riot, there is dignity, the little slip to smile, the ultimately quiet departure. Perhaps one of the most moving examples of this is a person of Vivian Baring, a professor of literature who was losing her fight to cancer in Margaret Edson's Pulitzer Prize winning play, Wit even as she turns to John Dunn for, quite, for comfort and strength. And I shall stop sharing for a moment just to see if I can find this. Be not proud, though some have called thee mighty and dreadful, for thou art not so. For those whom thou thinkst thou dost overthrow, die not, poor death, nor yet canst thou kill me. Thou art slave, 
to fate, chance, kings, and desperate men. And dust with poison, war, and sickness dwell. And poppy, or charms, can make us sleep as well and better than thy stroke. Why swell'st thou then? One short sleep past, we wake eternally. And death shall be no more, comma. Thou shalt die. That was Vivian Bering quoting Dunn. My next excursion, and I'm using this play as a segue into that, leads to the play and leading from this play to the chorus, which is the second C in the alliteration, again Greek, from the word choros, the word employed for a group of singers and dancers participating both in religious festivals and dramatic performances. Well, here the photograph is still is a still from the heart-wrenching French film Les Choristes. Now I crave indulgence for this choice of section, born as it is from an inveterate love for both music and theatre. Both forms are vibrant, even in their most melancholic forms, the deaths live in song and on stage, the shadow on face in a minor key. This is the world of the spectacle of the dithyram, where against the chorus emerges the solitary voice in theatrical terms, the protagonist. It is the protagonist who will frame stories, the protagonist who will sing a final aria, the protagonist for whom a requiem is composed. In the Oscar-winning motion picture Armadeus, it is Mozart who is seen to be writing a requiem at the behest of the scheming Salieri a requiem that is shown eventually and ironically to be for Mozart himself. For final arias, there is an interesting connection with disease, particularly tuberculosis, to which I said I would return. Well, this is in the 19th century, romance writ large and the languorous pallor of the face, the reinvigoration for that last effusion and then expiry. Well, here are three that follow in their train, La Traviata, La Boheme, and Le Conte of Man. Then there are musicals that do likewise. Uh, Moulin Rouge, which is still with TB, and Rent, where HIV AIDS is treated as the consumption of the 20th century, being derived directly from La Boheme. It is significant how some epidemics become the stuff of drama and film, consumption, cholera, cancer, of course the plague and HIV AIDS. It's strangely not particularly influenza, not of 1918, at least in the Western canon, nor since. Perhaps our current moment will find its artistic apotheosis if and when we achieve distance. I move from disease to social tumult. There is a particular piece where the chorus dwindles to a person and then she is gone. The dramatic Save Regina in Poulon's Dialogue of the Carmelites, where during the terror in France in the last decade of the 18th century, nuns belonging to the order are dispatched to the guillotine one by one. And in this particular scene, the nuns have gone. These are two that are left. One by one, they're heading to the guillotine. <laughs> 
what occasions hope in the face of immediate snuff out? I asked this question even as we move to another aspect of the chorus, standing in for the community, in this case, in conflict. We speak of the soldier and the soldier in the past. This is a Gettysburg National Cemetery. In this place on the 19th of November, 1863, one of the most famous speeches ever believed to have been written and delivered was done by Abraham Lincoln, short at just over 270 words. It is a statement of humility, empathy, and assurance. Let's look at some of these. Words like conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. And then let's go down here to this section. But in a larger sense, we cannot dedicate, we cannot consecrate, we cannot hallow this ground. The brave men, living and dead, who struggled here have consecrated it far above our poor power to add or detract. The world will little note or long remember what we say here, but it can never forget what they did here. It is for us, the living, rather, to be dedicated here to the unfinished work which they who fought here have thus far so nobly advanced. And they go on at the end to say that we highly resolve that these dead should not have died in vain, that this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom, and that government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. These resonant lines. Now, what's important over here is the fact, is the humility. The fact that we are ill-equipped to do this, yet we are the ones that remain. And thus we say it is for us the living to be dedicated to unfinished work. And this speech bears the mark of a long journey, a journey that sadly will be replicated in wars to come. For a conference that I was attending at Ypres on the great influenza on which I work, I took leave of the occasion to visit cemeteries, including the largest Commonwealth War Grave Commission run resting place anywhere, Tyne Cot. There are graves and there are memorials. Not far from Tyne Cot is Saint Julien with the brooding soldier raised by Canada for its soldiers who fell victim to the first gas attacks in the First World War. This is no mark of great triumph, just the sadness of solidarity and among the most powerful embodiments of grief in statuary. I choose this rather than such memorials as India Gate or the Arc de Triomphe because through the struggle, there is the memory of those that are lost, of those that are mourned, often marked by simple headstones, uniform in death as in life. We're two here, one Canadian, the other German, adversaries brought together in a frame. One of the most moving is in Ypres itself the Menin Gate, where the last post is bugled every evening. The enormity of loss is seen in its worldwide reach, as evidenced by this pair of plaques on one of its walls. The Sikhs, the Assamese, the Burmese. The Commonwealth War Graves Commission has cemeteries under its care worldwide. Just two, two months earlier than this time, with the centenary of the armistice ending the Great War, on the 11th of November, 2018. The choir of the Indian Institute of Science Education Research, at which I taught at the time, performed songs relating to both conflict and hope. And this is the choir in the cemetery. Like other Commonwealth War Graves Commission cemeteries, there is the same pattern of graves with the stone of remembrance bearing Kipling's inscription from Ecclesiasticus. Their name liveth forevermore. <laughs> 
And in the background, the cross of sacrifice. Thus it is that we pause for a space, moving from the towns and the cities of the living to those of the gone. In this case, marked by a reference to William Wordsworth, the solitary mm. reaper, and you may not be able to read it. And this is at the end where it says, the music in my heart I bore long after it was heard no more mm. on the grave of Winifred Maud, Maud Monroe. This moment allows us to turn to our last frame of reference, mm. the cemetery and my own intersection with it. And this is Mount Auburn in Cambridge, Massachusetts. It might have been in the Reader's Digest. It might have been in the gentle, spiritual, periodical guideposts. Despite searching for some time now, I've come up short. Yet years ago, as an adolescent, I remember reading an article bearing the name, I am no stranger to graveyards and being profoundly struck. Cemeteries had seemed unlikely places before then. There was one to the back of the Syrian Orthodox Church across the narrowest road from the house my grandmother inhabited and owned in Manganam, Kotem, Kerala. A road we took about a minute down and gaining the side closest to it, shimmying up the wall and gazing on six to seven sets of graves, some marked with concrete slabs, others with a plenitude of large rounded stones. I must have been eight and the imagination ran riot the thought of what lay within the ground, separated from sight by the implacable barriers we saw below us. There was both a shiver and a thrill shared by my cousins who visited, like my sister and I did, over the summers. And then we'd make our way to our respective homes. And at night, through the window of what we called the new room, because it'd been, it had been constructed years after the rest of the house, I would look towards that wall to which it was closest across our compound and continue to imagine. The article in, let's say for argument, Reader's Digest, inflected my view of fear. Instead, it left me with a profound sense of rest. I have always been drawn to graveyards since. Cemeteries, in some sense, have been sources of rich reward to me, ironically. Two of my most successful writing efforts, a play and a novel have largely been in place there. Yet what made me a cemeterian, or to use the proper term, a taffophile, someone who likes stones, was when, and inscriptions, was when I was invited soon after moving to Cambridge, Massachusetts, to visit the garden cemetery that you see on your screen, Mount Auburn, 20 odd minutes of a walk from Harvard Square. Mount Auburn, uh, was the United States' first garden cemetery, founded in 1831, and looking for inspiration, as indeed much the United States did to Europe. What was important here is that the garden cemetery in many ways was a place of rest, quite in contrast to the puritanical 17th century view of death being something to be feared, as in the old granary burial ground, where you can see the skull atop the... Uh, the grave. Now, as I mentioned, there was inspiration from Europe for, for many of the arts and garden cemeteries were no exception. Père Lachaise was the, was the major source of reference over here, itself founded in Paris in 1804 and playing host in death to a range of luminaries ranging from Frédéric François Chopin to Oscar Wilde, Edith Piaf to many of the Tatars, and indeed the composer of the Dialogue of the Carmelites, François Poulon. The Garden Cemetery itself had earlier antecedents, such as the one on Park Street in Calcutta that harked to the 18th century, which is a source of a number of points of literary mention, including Vikram Sates, The Suitable Boy, and Joan Didion's disquisition on the death of her husband, the year of magical thinking, particularly with reference to the grave of one of the cemetery's permanent occupants, Rose Almer, and that's largely because of this poem by Walter Savage Landor, which is on the side uh, um, over here. 
Yet it was Mount Auburn that commanded my attention and loyalty. This 174 acre area where I would grade my students' paper sitting by Halcyon Lake with the grave of Ellen H. Porter, author of Pollyanna, and one of several inspirational figures buried in the cemetery. It was in Mount Auburn that I would watch migratory birds rehearse an actress for that play I mentioned earlier in the cemetery, squirrel a dead squirrel in for interment, climb a tree and read, declaim when alone, get my students to perform a play based on some of the interiors in a chapel in the cemetery for the course Science, History and Theatre, and for over 10 years serve as an informal tour guide. I would at home lie down and listen to the audio guide reflections and in my mind's eye walk the paths mentioned to the sites described. In the cemetery, there was peace. One could not pick quarrels with the dead and that was comforting. For the uncounted hours spent in its precincts, Mount Auburn made me want to visit cemeteries everywhere and I did. The most significant of those visits occurred in a year long study uh, stay in London. I was working on a doctoral thesis on the making of zoology in India under the Fr British and the French. And some of the most seminal figures in that effort were buried in Highgate Cemetery, up the road from where I lived in Archway. I had visited the more accessible east side first and was reminded that even in death, it was possible to retain a sense of the lasting, if somewhat grim, humor that was attended. For example, this is there, it simply says, dead. I'd encountered moments of the kind before through anecdotal epitaphs, such as this. Here lies in silent clay, Miss Arabella Young, who on the 21st of May began to hold her tongue. And this about a dentist, when upon this grave you gaze with gravity, remember this, he's filling his last cavity. At Princeton, this is something I saw. I told you I was sick. Sometimes others contributed to the upturned tweak of lips, as here in La Cimetière de Montparnasse, at the grave of Camille Sanson, uh, and it says, thank you for the, cell, the, the cello concerto. It gave me tendinitis, but it was still worth it. Or back in this, uh, in, uh, on the east side of Highgate itself, where you've got the grave of Herbert Spencer, who introduced the term, uh, survival of the fittest, which Darwin picked up, and Karl Marx, resulting in people who work there calling it, because they're opposite each other, the Marx and Spencer corner. However, the people that I was studying were buried on the, we I was studying were buried on the west side, where it cost at the time 10 pounds to look to see if the grave was indeed there, and another 15 quid to find it. I took the easier option, and when the opportunity presented itself for me, to become an official volunteer tour guide, I leapt at it, because now I could find my object of interest myself and for free. And here's Highgate Cemetery on the west side, and this is the grave for which I was looking, Edward Blythe, the eminent zoologist for years a resident in India, 22 years who contributed uh, tremendously to the origin of species by Darwin and is mentioned over nearly 50 times in The Descent of Man. Now, as a historian, just as I was discovered in Mount Auburn, this was an extraordinary opportunity to see who shared real estate in death with who. And for a number of Saturdays, I would make my way to the cemetery and regale curious visitors with the stories that all of us had been told to relate of the cemetery by our mentor. This from In Memoriam, where we have the lines where uh, which Tennyson writes after a close friend dies, and he says, there sat the shadow feared of man, and we, are rem and we are reminded, and bear thee where I could not see, nor follow, though I walk in haste, and think that somewhere in the waste, the shadow sits and waits for me. This was founded in 1837, which one of the magnificent seven, ringing the city of London. Now, one of the key aspects of what we learned as tour guides in this beautiful place, and this is the path going up from there uh, on the west side, was iconography. And this is what we learned, and 
and when I and I cannot go to a cemetery now without looking to see what these what these mean the obelisk the urn the war memorial we have already seen the wreath clasped hands for you for for reunion hereafter and the promise of the resurrection in what is a Church of England uh, uh, cemetery. Uh, not all the cemetery is Church of England. There is there are parts of it that are considered dissenters, and those are unconsecrated. So even in the cemetery, there was a hierarchy. Over here, you have an obelisk. This is George Eliot grave, an obelisk, and you have this. And this is Egyptian, uh, and not the invasion of that country by Napoleon. And the seeming dollar sign is actually a superimposed element, which is IHS or Jesus hominem salvator, uh, Jesus savior of mankind. Keeping with the Egyptian theme, there is an Egyptian avenue that leads to a number of vaults over there. And in this area, there is a columbarium for ashes, the word derived from columba for pigeons and the immediate allusion to dove cults that contain urns. There are upturned, there are upturned tapers over here, turned upside down right over there suggesting that the torch of one's life had run out, and the Oribus suggesting the circle of life and representing it. Sometimes what you saw was self-explanatory, as in the case of the menagerist, George Wombwell. There were urns, Greek and robe with Greek with Roman veils, and the suggestion over here was that if the veil completely covered the urn, the person interred did not believe in the afterlife. I never encountered any in Highgate, so clearly options were being kept open. Then there were the angels in various forms. Sadness is here. Victory as with a trumpet and rest. Very often these represent children and form the basis for the author of Girl with a Pearl Earring, Tracy Chevalier's book, Falling Angels, while the writer of The Time Traveler's Wife, Audrey Neffingeniger, also placed a book in the context of Highgate, Her Fearful Symmetry. And both Tracy Chevalier and Audrey Neffingeniger are tr trained, like me, to be volunteer tour guides to get a sense of symmetry, which would eventually inform their books. As guides, we were careful to avoid places where active burials were underway. For all of the history, the sense of mourning was never far away. As Dickens observed upon having the coffin containing the body of his daughter, who died tragically young, from the vault to the outside, she wasn't getting enough of the sun. Are those we have lost getting enough of the sun? The question may seem trivial, flippant to those in our number who have seen their loved ones subjected to cremation and for others of a more practical turn of mind. And yet some of us wonder, those that live our lives by symbols, as I am now wearing the tie that I bought for my father from his doctoral alma mater, his belt, and the shirt that I wore when I received news of his passing just under six months ago. That said, I must point out that in no way was his departure a tragedy in the grand scheme of things. He was 86, had lived a productive life, and when he had to leave, it was mercifully swift. In the months since his passing, I have had much time to reflect, and one of my musings has been this. Imagine dying of a disease that earlier in your life you never knew existed, because for all the world at that time, it didn't. Say you were born in 1952 and fell to HIV AIDS in 1985 or COVID-19 in 2020. In that sense, my father's passing owed to a proper old fashioned heart attack. It was almost as if at 86, he was thumbing his nose at the newfangled lot on the block, taunting them with a catch me if you can. 
yet there is not a day that passes that his absence does not make its way into the hearts and minds of those that he left behind. As I write, I know that a man who meant such life to me, who emerged from a visit in Kerala to obtain a PhD in genetics from the University of Edinburgh, and whose choices then have inspired my own, lies interred on a hill eight kilometers away, sometimes under a blazing sun and sometimes otherwise. And we have, two days ago, spent his first birthday without his being with us. This is a cemetery where the feelings are different, where the mourning is my family's and mine. We went there after watching another relative's funeral online, with another's due next week, the weight owing to a son that needed to arrive from the United States, and in the knowledge that a flatmate and friend of mine, two years my junior, had just died in Kentucky owing to a freak choking incident. Yet we know that we are not exceptional, not now, not at this time of excruciating uncertainty. Our losses are mirrored and perhaps exceeded by a number of you that are listening today. And what my next slide will do is to provide this. Blankness. While each of us that has known loss intimately can superimpose on it for a space the faces of our beloved that are no longer with us as we remember. Thank you. At the end of the searching motion picture, Eve's Bayou, the eponymous protagonist says this. Memory is a selection of images, some elusive, others printed indelibly on the brain. Each image is like a thread, each thread woven together to make a tapestry of intricate texture. And the tapestry tells a story, and the story is our past. Drawing from this sentiment, I would contend that when it comes to grief, we remain the embodiment of its archives. Doubtless there are the photographs, the letters, the notes, the heartbreaking communications in various archives, physical repositories around the world on which the historian, documentarian and other researcher will draw. But even the contained archive is often fragmentary, akin to a fossil record, where both the nature of collection and active censorship can play such fateful roles. Is literature then the recourse to make sense of this cauldron of loss? One then is forced to confront the question, is grief derivative, or at least the words for it? Do we have to depend upon how someone else said it first? The familiar lines you've said and now hear akin to the tunes of Christmas carols like Hark the Herald Angels Sing, O Come All Ye Faithful or Silent Night, except that death isn't defined by December or January if you're Eastern Orthodox. But we have lines like, How sweet is death, death and his brother sleep. Death, be not proud, 
or do not go gentle into that good night? I cannot answer that question easily, except to venture. But there is a sharing that antedates words. In the months since my father left us, so many have reached me with readings that I have undertaken in preparation for this talk. My gracious host here today suggested Helen MacDonald's heartbreaking H's for Hawk and Joan Didion's A Year of Magical Thinking. A friend from the Office of Student Life at CREA offered C.S. Lewis's A Grief Observed. A student friend there reminded me of Tuesdays with Maury and that another had given me over a decade ago. And still another brought Randy Porsche's The Last Lecture again to my attention. Graduate student chums from Isapuna gave me Paul Cullen these when breath becomes air as a parting gift two years ago, but it was this passing that impelled my reading of it. A former colleague and friend very sweetly sent me Viktor Frankl's Man's Search for Meaning and its gentle propelling of the notion of logotherapy, which, given the author's experiences in a concentration camp, is such a witness to the power of a transforming and transformed attitude positivity. I have depended on all of these as well as Julian Barnes as nothing to be frightened of, offering from offerings from those that believe in a future beyond the grave and those that don't, but linked inseparably through the loss that they and we share. I realize that no matter how considerable the reading, it will always be partial, but there is an undercurrent through them all that reassures, and that is community. Hours before my father left us, he spoke to my sister who was attending him and asked her why it was that all of us were in such a hurry. He told her that he had been meditating on the majesty of creation in his own quiet way, steeped in his faith. He recounted the words of Psalm 19, the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament showeth his handiwork. These words are on his gravestone now. And even as I close, I turn to a poet who was born in the Cambridge that I knew in Massachusetts and became as perceptive as, as he was idiosyncratic and left us, did E.E. E. Cummings from since feeling his first, these words. For life's not a paragraph, and death, I think, is no parenthesis. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you. Uh, again, I'm sorry for your loss, and thanks so much for sharing, making this. Um, a way to sort of share and discuss with the community. Um, Thank you. We, of course, we could leave this open to, I mean, it's a very different conversation, but we could leave it open to questions and such. But I did want to just sort of start this conversation with you to ask something that you'd mentioned in between about how, how the individual, despite everything else, you know, the, as you said, the historian always resorts to the archive, to the, to the records, but in many ways, it is the individual who is the archive, who's the carrier of memories and is, forms the continuum for a set of people going forward. Um, could you elaborate on this thought a little bit more um, to, to give us a sense of how, how does a community come together in, in, such, um, in such instances of individual and collective loss? Um, how, where, where does the memory reside here then? There is the sense, I mean, um, so much of this, I think, and I've been, resides, as I said, in personal memory. And, and I looked to Eve's Bayou in some sense for that, for that sense of impulse, recognizing that memory is faulty, but what is different is the intimacy and the intimacy that we feel in, in connection to a moment. Now one could grant, I mean, one could suggest that 
perhaps objectivity is marred as a consequence because you are so close to the moment. And yet, it seems that so many traditions reside precisely because of the hold of that memory. I'm reminded of Alex Halley's roots. And when he goes back to Africa and you've got the Greer who was actually reciting the names of everybody. And that is an oral tradition and that is a memory. It's one of the most powerful encounters with the oral that I have ever known and of which I have ever known. And that embodiment is significant because it retains that sense of community. Now I grant that in some senses, this can also be dangerous. It's dangerous because it can be blinding. It's dangerous because it can be insular. It's dangerous because it can be conflictual. And yet, even as a historian, I wonder sometimes, there is an attempt, and you as an archivist knows this, know this, you who sedulously and meticulously try and get every document you can. But as I said, like a fossil record, it's fragmentary. There are some that we get and some that we don't. I'm reminded of the historian E.H. Carr talking about uh, the foreign minister in the Weimar Republic, uh, Feisman, and, and his wonderful, I mean, and how much he succeeded with Western Europe. But what was actively censored was his significantly less favorable reception with the Soviet Union. Uh, and so this is uh, with, with, with Russia at that point in time. So, and, and so, and I was, and I was musing about the, upon that and saying, well, how do we sift this? Are there, does it boil down eventually to who the gatekeeper is and what you're allowed? And, and, in some, and that's a longer conversation with you as an archivist, to, the other archivists would probably need to enter. But even as a historian, being very grateful to the many archives that I've had an opportunity to visit, it's still something that troubles me. Thank you. Thank you. No, it was just more of a discussion and comment. I don't have a good answer to that either. Um, but it's something that we do think about in the archives about what, what, you know, what does get discovered and reimagined as we go forward. Um, you, you commented about various traditions and um, a, a person who's in the audience, Srinivas Murthy, I believe, had a question related to that. And uh, if I may ask you to go ahead and unmute yourself and ask the question, if you could. Um, are you able to do so? Uh, I think, do you want to ask? I, uh, Srinivas Murthy, if you're able yeah. to go ahead and unmute yourself and ask the question, that would be great. Okay, failing which, what I'll do is I'll just ask the question for, for this person. So first of all, he, he thanked you. So this is, uh, and I quote, this has been a brilliant presentation. The illustrations were exquisite. Um, and he said, would you be able to share the difference in approaching grief in different religions? Um, are there ways in which different traditions, I suppose, have thought of this, uh, this idea or, or, or this, this way of looking at grief? So any thoughts around that would be? Well, beyond, okay, let me start with a disclaimer. My, all of my, my experience has been with the Judeo-Christian world largely, and that's just as a function of where I was a tour guide apart from where I, where I grew up, but uh, even, but in places like, like Mount Auburn and, uh, and Highgate, they are technically now non-sectarian. And so you can, and as I mentioned, there was this element where you, are, where you have dissenters. I know that within Christendom, there are different traditions, the Day of the Dead, for example, which we have in Mexico, which is a very strongly Catholic idea and which is tied up greatly with All Saints and All Souls Day, something that isn't observed as much in Protestantism. Uh, there is, I, 
I have been deeply moved by observances every day when I have gone to Sufi dargahs. And that has been, and the fact that we can have the Qawwali being, uh, being sung. And there is this profound sense, whether it's a feeling that might, that has just sprung over or the other, uh, and is not necessarily born out in fact, but hopefully is, that we are at the site of very good people. And uh, we've, there is that. Um, I haven't spent enough time except to visit when there have been those that have passed away that belong uh, to other faiths. I mean, Hinduism to some extent, and, uh, and Islam, as I've, as I've mentioned before, but uh, certainly not the indigenous faiths in the United States where I lived for a long time, but I've read from the likes of people like Robin Wall Kimmerer from Braiding Sweetgrass about traditions that are held dear there, but I can only speak of those at second hand, not having seen. Yeah, when the question came up, I was reminded, I mean, just on a personal note, 12 years ago, I was uh, reporting within a community in New York City, 11 years ago, where, and one of the things that just happened to be, um, there was a funeral that I had to go report on, and um, um, there was an expectation that everyone would contribute to the funeral, that, you know, it's, it's, it, there's a community sort of gathering where you're expected to sort of, you know, bear the costs of this, and the broader idea is that if you don't do it, you know, whenever it's your turn to, you know, need there will be the community member to sort of step forward. So there are ways in which everyone sort of rallies around. Um, and there's, there's a proper record keeping around it. So, you know, talking about the archival or archiving efforts around that. So there's, there's a question of, you know, who gave what uh, sort of process. The very um, material sense, right? Yes. <laughs> uh, so that's a very different sort of way of looking. But uh, Reni, I believe, had a question. And Reni, if you can unmute yourself, we could go ahead and ask. Hi, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, please go ahead. Yeah. Uh, hi. Great. I mean, it was a great lecture. I do really want to think with you on the mm -hmm. connection between grief and uh, solidarity. Like, you know, so can we really think about grief actually beyond individual laws? Because, and how it becomes, for example, a place for sharing and belonging. So, for example, if you think about the whole notion of political grief, so I think it is an interesting imaginative world to think beyond individual laws. So like really wanted to talk about the connection between grief and solidarity. Yeah. I thank you, Reni. That's a very thoughtful question. And I think it depends, it seems to me on the nature of the community and to what end grief can be deployed. I'm, is it the loss? Is there, are there attendant feelings upon it? Does something emerge? Is there anger? Is that directed in a particular way? This is what concerns me in some sense um, about in the politicization of grief in, in, in many ways and uh, I've, I, I'm hesitant in some sense to say this, but sometimes community grief can become its own industry. And when that happens, the suggestion is we've been done hard by you owe us. Now, is there a statute of limitations upon community grief? Is there one, does that differ from individual grief, the sense of loss that you have, uh, you will probably have for a lifetime, but how is that, how is that shared? And this is something which is interesting because the walk that you take, even if someone else has lost just that member of a family that you have, may not be exactly the same. And yet 
we know there is some level of sharing where the community is. How that gets deployed on the outside and what is said is what worries me. I think it's easier to have the reading. It's easier to turn to, as I said, when Venkat gave me Ellen McDonald's suggested H is for Hawk, and to have that sense of resonance. And as I said, in the quiet places, that that was, that that was useful. But I'm concerned about industries and what can emerge from them. Um, what do you think, Renny? No, I mean, I, you know, I was just thinking about this, right? I mean, you know, really, because individual loss, of course, is there, but like, you know, can we really transcend that individual loss? Because after a point of time, like, you know, the whole notion of sharing and belonging becomes important. So in the, it is in that context I was, uh, you know, asking this question. So there, for example, the whole idea of uh, grief that happens in places like Kashmir. So it might be individual loss, but then after a point of time, it has the power to transcend, right, from individual to community. So, yeah, I was just, you know, thinking through this lens. So yeah. Do you think in some sense that that sense of loss needs time? That when the immediacy of it sometimes, in some sense, gets attenuated with the passage of weeks and months, that the possibilities of it's becoming more shared become real? and something else. Is that, do you think that is a possibility? Would your line of thinking take you there? Uh, I really don't know anything, I don't really think, yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, because it's important because there's an object and the object is really what emerges. And again, we don't know, and we have some very interesting questions, thank you about, uh, I don't know if our anonymous attendee is still here, but if you are, I will take those in a, in a second. But just to stay with Rennie for a moment, I think the object becomes really important. And as I said, I'm, I don't, I, I'm concerned about industries. I'm concerned about, about what happens if, and, and, and it's not as if, there isn't a certain level of, of, uh, of legitimate wrong and legitimate hurt and legitimate pain, but it becomes after a while a particular nature of discourse. And, and you wonder whether first principles sometimes get occluded in that larger community. Uh, rendering, if you will. As far as the two contrasting beliefs about one who believes in the afterlife and the other who don't, is there, it's, again, it differs because I know that people like Philip Pullman, who does not believe. John, yeah. uh, sorry to interrupt, but it's just that there are folks who also watch this on YouTube, so uh, they may not be able to see the question. So if you don't mind, I'll read, I'm gonna, I'll read them out, I'll read them out. I'm just okay. going to read it out and okay. you can respond to it. So there are two anonymous questions in the Q&A on the Zoom platform. Um, okay. One says, I quote, um, thanks for this heartwarming presentation. You mentioned about two contrasting beliefs, one who believes in the afterlife and the other who doesn't or who, uh, who don't. Could you perhaps elaborate on how? if there is any, uh, how archiving grief is different in these two beliefs. Go ahead, John. Uh, thank you, Venkat. In the first case there, well, it's, it isn't necessarily a straight bimodal. There, there you have, it also depends upon what the nature of belief is in the first place. Is there a belief in a personal God uh, to whom you, to whom you will turn. I know that there are a number of books that one has encountered which talk about heaven and what it's like and the physicality of place. Others who think of it in a sense of distance. Um, other which are more, who are more mechanistic about it. Others who just feel a deep sense of sadness. I mean, Julian Barnes uh, does that. He, he calls himself agnostic, but in very interesting the way he starts the book he says, I do not believe in God, but I miss him. 
and it's and there's a deep sense of of uh, of poignancy in that statement. Now, those that are believers very often tend to be, I mean, some tend to be cruel about that. And they say, well, it's your loss that you don't believe. And what is lost in that is the sense of searching, irrespective of where it may take that person. E.O. Wilson, who also has spoken in mean, naturalist, and I mean, this, this is the, the great naturalist and myrmecologist and expert in, at Harvard, has also spoken about how he didn't, I mean, his faith, I mean, had largely waned, but how he went, found himself in a church and was crying. And I, and is there a quest, and even if it isn't necessarily leading to the kind of Godhead, what is it? And that is something that requires unpacking. Now, this is very different from, at least on, in stated terms, a Richard Dawkins, who will, who is very, he's implacable about his position and takes it that, that way, or a Christopher Hitchens. Someone like a Philip Pullman, for example, would be willing to, to discuss this the more when he writes a book like the good man Jesus and the scoundrel Christ. And, it's, uh, and that becomes, uh, and, that's, and that's interesting the way he, he deals with it. Uh, Stephen Jay Gould, who was, again, did not have a particular faith, but was remarkably respectful and would come up with the notion of non-overlapping magisteria, where he looks at religion and science as very different, I mean, answering different kinds of questions. So when you, and I was teaching for Stephen Jay Gould, the, the trimester he died, and there was so much reference at that time to the Talmud of scriptures and what it, and, and to Psalm 1, and it was, and to watch someone in some sense who's taken particular positions in many ways die in front of you and is, is hard because you're also seeing him from the point of view of the intellectual journey that he's taking, he's taken. And suddenly all of that is in front of you and you're sitting and trying to make sense of it. So that is my wholly inadequate answer, but I'm drawing upon examples, if you will, from, my, from what I've read and what I have personally witnessed in an attempt to take a stab at it. Uh, Thanks, John. Thank we'll take uh, maybe I'm three I'm happy questions. to take whichever. Um, there's a person who raised their hand, Yashodra, if I could ask you to go ahead and unmute yourself and ask your question, if you still have one. Um, if you're uh, not sure if you're still around. Okay, um, we'll, we'll get to the other two anonymous questions, John, and I'm just gonna read them out for you and then you can respond to those two. Um, I quote, um, what do you think of um, quote, pagan practices uh, that do not engage in memorialization? Um, I'm here also referring to representation of uh, life through images, written words, etc., cetera, um, which has a different temporality than oral remembering. One moans, but doesn't frame the life as, quote, lost, but, quote, lived. I think Darian Leader, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing the name right, notes as a psychoanalyst that it serves as a more stronger counterweight to melancholia while getting done with the work of mourning. Um, not knowing as much about this particular situation, I'm curious, what is 
what is the nature of response to death more generally? And uh, you, you might say it's a lived experience, but what is, but what is the community structure like? It seems to me that so much of this, even the no notion of mourning is in so many ways, even if individual, societal at the same time. And I'm, and I'm curious in this particular case as to, as if it's a counterweight to melancholia, perhaps, but it isn't a one-off, right? It's much more about the entire social structure that we are considering from which this particular response is emergent. And uh, to that end, I'll need to know more. And otherwise it becomes this one carved out aspect. And I'm, so I, so I don't know, but in and of itself, it's a stronger counterweight to melancholia. Perhaps I think that this is also true in a number of the mainstream religions as well, because there, there are differences. There are those who will talk about lives well lived, people who will celebrate those that have passed. There is, there's it in Ghana where you have the dancing pole bearers and you know, so you and, and, and this is why it's actually interesting where you have local practice in many ways, uh, queering the pitch uh, when it comes to what is supposed to be a faith, but is a Ghanaian Muslim different from an Indonesian one or a Christian likewise, or then in just in terms of local practice. And I think it's important to do that. Otherwise we run the risk of, of thinking about communities in very monolithic terms and that could eventually be to our peril. And that is what I'm saying. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I think Rennie had another question, but I'm just, um, just to distribute, I'm going to pick up on another anonymous question for you. Yeah. Um, and I'll just read it out. Uh, I'm just going to quote directly. Very sorry for your loss. And thank you sh for sharing this with us, John, and a brilliant presentation as always. My question is to do with how one decides to go about trying to come to terms with a loss. More often than not, I have found that in times of loss, I prefer to try and cope via some act of creation, be it through writing a piece of poetry, prose or music, or through trying to numb myself via some movie or documentary or series. How important is the medium in this regard? I'm aware that certain coping mechanisms can be harmful, but at what point does the coping mechanism become important and whether it's archival is important um, to look back upon or not? Thank you, end quote. In my own experience, and this has been the most excruciating loss I've had, and I've had a few, and those have been extremely difficult as well. I've, uh, I think some of this is, I mean, at, at a personal level, and I said this earlier in my talk, that I've tried to live this by the symbolic, by the little things that you pick up, the material symbolic, if you will, uh, what you what you do, what you think. I mean, what you how you deport yourself in some senses. I know that for the long for at least five months, every nine days, I was writing a poem, and it was for my father, and it was or a story, or you know. So there was there was that, and it was, and you would, and the. Uh, the poems, I dare say, are eminently forgettable. But the fact is, you were there was that for a while. And the other thing that I found myself doing, it wasn't just acts of, cre of creativity, it was in steeping yourself in activity so as not to afford yourself the time to think because when you did, you would go to pieces. And um, that I found to be true. And I think those are places where it is individual coping in a very fierce way. And uh, now as far as, and 
I know. Uh, should I go on? I know Vijay. Uh, Vijay and I asked the question, but I'm. There is thoughts on the role of memory. Should I take that? Because that's also from anonymous attendees. So should I? Um, let's uh, let's just pull on. Uh, Can I go to Vijay? I mean, are they are they linked questions? They're actually linked questions, right? So yeah, after a disaster or mass shooting. Maybe we uh, can take upon, um, if we could just call upon maybe Vijay and Amrita, well, is that fine? Would you be okay with that? We could probably just ask them. Of course, I mean, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So Vijay Kumar, if you could just go ahead and voice your question, that would be great. You should be able to unmute yourself now. Vijay? I think he's unmuted himself. Let me see. Hello. Can you hear me? Very faintly. You're going to have to talk a whole lot louder, actually. Sorry. Yeah. Is that Vijay? Come on, Vijay. Vijay? Okay. I don't think we can hear him. Should we yeah. try reading? Should we try reading his question? Sure, I'll just do that. Yeah. Um, the question is, quote, more than people coping with grief, almost always tied to their cultures. I'm worried about those who are keen that others are forced to mourn. Um, and there's a particular uh, comment here about a, a news item recently about eight people in Indiana mm -hmm. having been killed in another mass shooting. Um, I don't, I mean, I wish I could comment if I could even begin to understand. But the truth is, I've never been able to. Not in this, not, I mean, you might say it boils down to a variable. There is someone, I don't have a microphone. Um, it might boil down to a particular variable. There's someone that dislikes those that are in same sex relations and so goes ahead and does something. But if, if it's very difficult to make sense of it because all of us hold multiple identities in our body. So that's why it's difficult for me even to begin to understand. But if someone were to come from that mindset, then it's a very different living principle. And that's why to comment further than that would for me be impossible. Persons moccasins is the saying from Native American Girl because I don't understand. And so that's, and I don't know if many of us can seated over here, if we are likewise inclined at least the way I am at this point in time. So yeah. Uh, I'm gonna call on Sandhya who's uh, I believe logged in through Rennie's account. Just and also, yeah, there's also Amrita, no? Right, we can ask that to wrap it up. But Sandhya, are you able to... Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, go ahead, yeah. I'm so sorry for this mix-up. I just... Not at all. Go ahead, yeah. Uh, Rennie's uh, login. Um, just go ahead, yeah. Yeah, um, uh, thank you, uh, John, for that fascinating um, lecture and the discussion uh, that we've been having. It's... Um, Especially taking us through all of these different uh, modalities of uh, of a post life, you know, uh, or an afterlife. Um, uh, I mean, part of my question is to do with the kind of labor that goes into maintaining that afterlife, whether it is in the form of graves and and a kind of monumentalization that you know. Uh, I mean. Uh, particularly the kind that you see in the case of people like, let's say, Marx or Oscar Wilde or, uh, um, you know, Jim Morrison and, and, uh, and the kind of, you know, the, the memorialization that goes on uh, after. Um, and of course, there is a certain kind of um, um, celebrity status that 
gets accorded to the to the grave as well you know it becomes touristy it is it is sold um as a feature you know and, and especially in highgate for example you have badges uh being sold uh marks badges being sold and you know all of that so there is an industry that kind of also takes over uh at the same time and this is something that i also that i noticed especially in highgate um many of the graves had uh, flower beds that were maintained uh but when it came to the graves of women um uh, none of their graves had flowers or or the flower beds were not being maintained and that really told me a lot about who does the work of memorialization as well you know the labor that goes into maintaining that afterlife um do you have any thoughts on this about uh who does that work and how it gets of course uh how it becomes a sort of a becomes part of a larger consumer culture of course but even in a in a uh in a in a closer intimate way uh there is there is a certain sense in which the labor of memory uh, is undertaken by certain kinds of people um i'm trying to get a sense of this okay let's just go back to this you, the suggestion is that the flower beds around women's graves are not being maintained like they were around men is that yes. Yeah. the major yeah. issue. Yeah. I'm wondering about that. I thought with Claudia Virgin who actually started the Notting Hill Festival and there were a lot of flowers and this on that's on Stratcona on the east side and that was and that was observed quite quite well. So I don't do you know in where okay how where I mean if you know Highgate reasonably well was this on the west or the east side and do you know where um i'm guessing this was probably uh the west side okay uh, so you you go through the gate you go through that large building you go up the steps is that it um i'm trying is that to what you do? Uh, we've got this gothic uh, building anybody entrance you've got to, entrance, you've got to go I, through it is that it the gate that there, there is a there is like a tourist center i mean where you basically um pay to get in and yes, that's, that's the west side that's the west side yeah Yeah. yeah, I mean, no, actually, you can't pay on the east side as well. It's just that you, the amounts are different. It's, I think, it's three quid and seven quid. I may have gone up to five and ten now. <laughs> yeah. I didn't know which it was. So yeah. So, um, yeah. but but if you went, okay, here's 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 a. Well, did you have to go on a guided tour, or could you guide yourself? This is the key thing. Uh, no, uh, we went by ourselves. We just okay. Then then you were then you were on the east side. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, fine. So, so. Yeah, so this is something that. Um, um i mean we just went in basically to just uh take a look and also because of marks uh of course that's his idea yeah, yeah, yeah sure. but also uh this is something that um uh, i mean a few of us we actually started noticing as a, a kind of a recurring uh, motif um and uh it i mean at, at first it it obviously it does not strike you but as you do as you walk through the the rows um you begin to notice that there is a there is a sense of certain graves being more derelict than Not other and those seem to be far more um graves of women um that, yeah now that's interesting because the the way it is is that you buy you pay for your grave for a certain number of years and then afterwards you will be asked to give more for up keep and if you don't it will be kept irrespective of uh of whether you're male or female and uh and that and that was one of the things that we were that we were taught as and so i mean i showed you the grave of the person i was seeking to study edward blight and you saw the the condition in which his grave was for instance and uh, i remember john singer sergeant the son of the painter his grave was in pretty bad shape a bomb had dropped on it and it hadn't really been fixed so it so a lot has to do really with the family and whether the family is willing to pitch in and do something there are also more recent graves and those are getting a great deal of attention 
but since a very close friend of mine who actually um, trained with me, his daughter is buried there, and John Waite, and he continues to be a tour guide, I could put this question to him and ask him what the latest scoop is on just this. Yeah, that would be that would be quite interesting. I mean, just to just to see if this is borne out, you know, um, by um, by whatever. I mean, by observing um, I don't know, larger larger uh, tracks there of of uh, the the grave the graveyard itself. Um, yeah, but it was just uh, because we covered a fair, we covered fair ground, and and um, and it, it, this was just something that that became more and more noticeable. Um, so of course there would be uh, particular, let's say, graves belonging to uh, to men, which would also be in really uh, okay, yeah. bad condition. But um, as a almost as as a rule, it just seemed to be. Uh, tilted in, really? in, in in certain gendered ways, um, and which is why I mean it just came up because when when you were discussing um, Highgate, it just mm -hmm. I, it just struck me that this was something that um, had been quite uh, noticeable in that regard. But yeah, I mean, thank you for. I know, I, I, and that's distinctly odd actually because I just know how many of the people working there were women, and it's uh, and that and that's actually really fascinating, but. That was a decade ago, so I could ask John and see what the what the situation is. And of course, the kind of, I mean, there are also women who are really known. There, George Eliot, for example, in her graves, at least then, was maintained in mint condition. So I wonder if some of it has to do also with status of person, irrespective. But that's another angle to consider. So yeah, thank that's you. Awesome. Thanks, Sandhya. Thank you. Um, we're almost out of time, but uh, maybe, John, we can take one more question. With, and I'm I'm just, happy, I mean, which, uh, whoever wants to ask them. Yeah, so I'll just wrap this. We'll wrap it up with one question from Amrita, and I'll read it out because uh, I believe she's unable to speak it out. Okay, I, yeah, quote, yeah. Um, I quote, it's interesting that grief on loss can be expanded to other living organisms too. Pets, loss of a tree, loss of a forest. The relevance of such losses are perhaps even more difficult to explain or archive as not everyone has the opportunity to be attached to these things in the same way. I mean, humans may be able to relate to human loss as they are almost always associated with other humans, but not every human experience, not, not every human experience is like with a pet or a favorite tree. How is such a loss expressed? How does community cope with this? How are these archived? I'm trying to read the question. I can't seem to find it. It's uh, the one open question in the Q&A. It says, I can see, I can see Amrita's second comment, but it's for some reason I can't see the first. Well, to, to summarize it, the question is, you know, how is, how is lost, how is loss expressed? How does the community cope with, with, with losses that go beyond humans? I mean, with other living organisms, pets, losses of trees, losses of forest, how, how are these archived in, um, in your imagination? I was, if I didn't, go here, but I was, I mean, there are two immediate answers. One is if it's humans vis-a-vis -vis animals, I don't necessarily see those always as different because it's still the human being that's feeling, I think. And if anything, there's a anthropomorphizing of the animal's reaction to us. But I was going to point to one of the one of the stories that I was going to about which I was going to speak in the larger research frame. I've been researching for this paper for some time, but um, the larger research frame was Maria dos Prazeres, which is uh, uh, from Gabriel Garcia Marquez from Strange Pilgrims, and uh, how she was she was with this dog and. In some ways, she was training the dog to cry. If she went first, the dog would go on Sundays. And it was this very interesting story that was inverted in some sense. And uh, 
I was thinking of raising it along with the story of Grey Friars Bobby, which was this dog which sat by his master's grave for a very long time. And there's a statue of it on uh, in Edinburgh, uh, very close to uni. I think my, yes, I think in many ways, I, I, I hesitate to call it displacement behavior, where in some senses there's an expectation that's different and almost more comforting when it comes to another species. Just like I said, you can't pick quarrels with the dead. You don't necessarily pick quarrels with your pets. And I think that that, in some sense, could have something to do with the nature of reassurance that you can get sometimes. And so if that is maintained over a... I mean, the quantum of time doesn't really matter. You can... I remember... I, how much I missed a buff striped keelback, a snake that I had for only five months, because it was it was it was probably the gentlest snake I'd ever had. But notice the word that I'm using, gentle, and that again is rooted in a very human centric. But uh, yeah, it's going to be my own ways. I don't see us as being necessarily different. And I think there is reassurance when you can't be answered in terms that sometimes may not sit the best with you, which can happen from another human being. And so I think sometimes your morning could be different because there's all of that that gets imbricated in the process. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Pleasure. I can't thank you enough. This has been a stimulating conversation, but Really, thank you for, for sharing. Uh, no, thank you so much. And uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity. I mean, I just want to thank you, especially, Venkat. And Venkat, I know that when I asked you if I could do this, and I dropped absolutely everything because, honestly, nothing else really mattered at that point in time. And for you to have the largeness to accept this as a theme and to encourage it is something that means so very much to me. So thank you. Very kind of you. Thank you. Um, let's maybe you and I can just chat a little bit more, but for now we can uh, wrap the public sort of scope of the conversation again on behalf of the campus. I thank all of you for being here. Um, and for those of you who are still around, thank you for sort of staying around so long. And um, if, if you like the lecture series, do come by next month, uh, which would be a conversation around belonging. Um, so we'll be talking about the history or the thoughts around belonging. That'll be on May 13th, a 